turning up and uh, being interesting about listening uh, about Brazil and about the her story of this amazing woman who was a Marielle Franco. Who is Marielle Franco? Uh, I would like to say a few things about how this presentation is organized. Uh, this is a her story, so from a black feminist, black feminist epistemology, her story is the uh, biography told sometimes in first person and sometimes in third person. In this case, it's her story, it's not my story. And I will try to associate her story with the stories of many black women that are living under the oppression of a racist regime, not just when it's being called authoritarian, but also the process of a racist regime through colonial times. I mean, I mean by uh, not only authoritarian regimes, because even during the democracy, what we call democracy in Brazil, many black people were being killed. So since, since black people were kidnapped by the sh in the shores of Africa and brought to Brazil, and enslaved, black people did not stop being killed. And now we can call a genocide of the black, pe black population in Brazil. This is something very important for you to know because when we are starting to talk about her story, Marielle Franco's story, we need to see how this is connected. You know, it's not just one story that is isolated from everything that is happening in Brazil. So uh, in each one of these slides, you're going to see Marielle Franco's face because I think it's important for you to see uh, or even sometimes even listen to the voice of the person we are talking about. In this session, I'm not going to show videos, uh, but I think it's important to see and to kind of uh, materialize uh, her presence here. Uh, so if you have any questions, please, you can we can make this conversation interactive. You can ask questions, especially because I'm very used to talk about Brazil, and it might, you might need more context. And if that's the case, you, you can you can just raise your hand, and we can go from there. Okay. Um, all right, Marielle Franco. First, I'm going to say who she, uh, how her life was involved in which context. So she was uh, born in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, Complexo da Favela da Maré. This is a picture of the complex. So you can see it's like a small city, or uh, even bigger than Lisbon, maybe. And we call it complex because it's not only one favela. There are many communities here. And for each community, this is a map from 2016, these colors. It might have changed now, but the areas in, in green is, uh, or let's say, there is a monopoly of organization from the militia. In the red part is the Comando Vermelho, is the red command that it's a criminal organization. And the yellow is the the, I'm sorry, I don't want to say anything wrong, the TCP, Terceiro Comando Puro, which is, I, I couldn't translate, but it's another criminal organization. It's the Third Pure Command. It's just, translating these words doesn't mean much. It, what it means is like the entire meaning of how they understand themselves and create identity through that. Uh, so you, you, can, you can see that a crime is something that is present in the history of, of Complex da Maré, uh, but that's not the way that we are going to stereotype the idea of favelas in this conversation, okay? I wanted to bring this, com this map for you to see how big it is and in which kind of scene or, uh, or context Marielle was growing up because in one of her uh, interviews, she says, well, it was, it was common to go to school sometimes and have to you know, pass dead bodies and this kind of thing. So this n naturalization or normative of favela being the crime scene in Rio de Janeiro is the way that 
black people are being uh, profiled and stereotyped and therefore justify the killings in the favelas because they are seen as criminals all the time, even if they are just workers. Uh, Marielle was born in 79, and she was a baby mama, baby mama, she was a mother, <laughs> at the age of 19 years old. Um, because she, she got pregnant uh, when she was 18, she was doing a, a, a course at, prior to university, uh, and she, she had to stop studying for a while so she could uh, give birth to, to Luyara Santos, that's the name of her daughter. And after that, she went absolutely out of the expectations of the black young mother living in a favela. She got a scholarship and she went to university. Hello, one of my students. <laughs> And well, and she went to PUC Rio de Janeiro. This scholarship, it's important to say, it was uh, a creation from the uh, social policy of Lula government, uh, the Labour Party, called ProUni, Programa Universidade para Todos. It's a program that is called University for All, and people with from a working class, poor backgrounds could have access to universities such as PUC Rio. PUC is a Catholic university in Rio de Janeiro that is very well known by its quality, but it's also high prices. So she managed to, to go to a university that is elite university, okay? And then she did her MA in public administration, uh, pretty much inspired by the assassination of one of her friends in this war in the, in the favela. And her friend was killed by a lost bullet. That's what we, we call lost bullet, but it's actually pretty much found bullet. It found someone's head, it found someone's body, and it killed this person. And then she decided to, call, to understand the public administration from how the, this public administration offers security or the idea of security to people. Her dissertation was about the pacifier police intervention uh, units in the favelas. That's what we call UPP. And in this dissertation, she's already calling attention to the problem of the idea that the police is going to offer peace in the community which is not true. The, the, the community is, has the agency and the power to bring peace to the community. When the police arrives, it brings lost bullets. It brings more war on drugs, and it brings more dead bodies in the favelas. She's denouncing a violent system. That's what she's doing with her dissertation. And through all this time, she's doing activism in the community. She's engaged in anti-racist, uh, anti-LGBTQ uh, phobias, and she's, she's in human rights social movements that made sense to create her platform to be engaged in the, um, in the socialist party that it was created from the rupture of the Labour Party after Lula was elected in, uh, sorry, Lula was elected in? 2002. 2002. So after that, the, the, the party for, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, I just catch you in surprise. <laughs> um, and okay, this party became a, a, what we know nowadays as maybe the only or the few uh, parties that is from the left in Brazil. Um, so this was her agenda, okay? And what I'm calling global engagement uh, is it's global, it's international, it has different voices, and it's also local. It's from the favela to the world and from the world to the favela. What Marielle is doing here, this 
is her campaign picture. This is Our Lives Matter. She is discussing and she's opening a dialogue with Black Lives Matter campaign. But here she's putting a different nuance to this Black Lives Matter kind of context. She's, she's putting claims, she's putting goals and strategies to design policies for black people in Rio de Janeiro. Especially what she, she's calling a triangle that is part of her campaign, which is gender, race, and the city. That's what she's saying. She brought from the experience from the favelas to her campaign and to her, the way she was um, acting through her um, political life. So she was elected the city councilor of the municipal chamber of Rio de Janeiro. She was from this uh, socialist party. And from 2016, it wa there was a, a turn in the representation of black women in politics. It's important to say this because, as I said before, this is not an isolated uh, story. With Marielle, Taliria, and many others, black women were elected uh, in, as city councillors, as members of the ministries, and so on, uh, as part of the political scene in Brazil. This is important to say, OK? And just remember this, because I will get this hook after to explain the, the, the current context in Brazil and the criticism that black women in politics are suffering. All right, she was the fifth most voted in the city and the second woman most voted in the city. Just a reminder, Rio de Janeiro was the capital of Brazil before Brasilia was constructed. That means that there is the, the social, the, the colonial swag, let's say, the colonial way of thinking is still very present in the city. If you go to Rio de Janeiro, if you've ever been to Rio de Janeiro, you're going to see even the buildings are very colonial or a kind of imitation from the French style of the lamps and so on. This is not only in the architecture, it's, it's also in the, poli in the politics. So how come uh, a place that was uh, the capital of Brazil never had so many black women representing the population? And the population in Brazil is more than 50% self-identified black people. Okay? So this is very important. I'm not talking about something that is uh, random and the, the number of the population in Brazil is lower in terms of black people. We're talking about serious political representation in terms of statistics, in, in terms of, of course, social and cultural uh, engagement with what Brazilian population means, right? Okay, and this international, this global, this global and this local made a very, uh, made a difference also for the new generations that was voting, that was starting voting, so young people that was like watching the controversial Beyonce doing her uh, 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 choreography on the Black Panther, uh, using the Black Panther kind of uh, clothes, very tight and small clothes. Uh, they were, n they knew what Black Lives Matter was, was doing at that point because it's through pop culture. I'm not saying that Brazilian, young Brazilian people just watch Beyonce. It's, I don't want to put my people in that place. I'm just saying that it's, it was massive, like had billions of people watching. And sometimes even the first contact that some young generation had with Black Panther. Uh, but at the same time, it is problematic. So what Marielle offers is something very political. She's coming in a very serious, uh, with a very serious agenda. And she was calling attention to how institutional racism is being lived and how it was affecting uh, people of color, especially black people in the country, and more specifically in, in Rio de Janeiro. Yeah? By institutional racism, 
uh, we usually use these words in academic contexts, and it sounds like it's just coming from the book. Marielle does something that is really interesting because she has a, a power of translation and she goes and in, in her presentation for her uh, elections, she said, this language didn't arrive in the favelas. So we have to translate, we have to be, to have the power to engage with people in the favelas. From now on, favelados, favelada, okay? I'm going to use this term. People who live in the favelas are what you call favelados. I think this term is more very, very political, and you're going to understand later on. I will remind you, but just to introduce this topic, okay? Marielle, then, this is her in one of her speeches in the in the city chamber, and in her T-shirt is written. Diverse, but not disperse, which is also another political statement. She's very well known by the headscarves. And she's saying that we are together. And she started to explain her agenda to all the politicians that were very used to the, to the chambers, uh, white, male, middle class, well-educated, who never put forward an agenda or any kind of a law or project to help people in the favelas or to change their lives, right? So that was her role. And in her last discourse, she was killed uh, on the 14th of March. In that month, we were celebrating the International Women's Day, okay? And her last discourse was about the genocide of black women in Brazil. But she was very intersectional in the way she was looking at that because uh, we, at that point, were analyzing it was like a bombastic news about the killing of women in Brazil. That became a law that is called feminicide, okay? Uh, the killing of women. And the, the feminicide means uh, the killing of women just because they are women. And then there are nuances. According to the context of feminicide, it can be because of uh, uh, a consequence of domestic violence. It can be usually by uh, these women's partners. Uh, it can be in the context of a family. But it also can be in the context of a misogynist uh, state, for example, right? So feminicide, she's talking about feminicide in this discourse. That became a law in Brazil. Like uh, when we name things, the reason why we name things is because we give meanings to this and we address to this in a special way. That's why I'm sitting on a chair and I'm not sitting on the air. Otherwise it wouldn't make sense and we wouldn't be able to have this conversation. When we name things, that's a very symbolic way to understand how things need to have attention. Right? So the attention to the killing of women is something that Marielle was talking about. But she said, and these are data that is, for, for me is really surprising. Uh, the, the data we have is from 2003 and 2013, and there was a growth of the killing of women of 21%. And she was like, this number is very high. However, the killing of among white women decreased 9.8%, and the killing of black women increased 54%. So we can, like, for sure say that there is a genocide of black women happening. But the numbers don't talk about something that Marielle was calling attention in this last speech. She was saying, we don't have in numbers how people are being, how black women are being killed because they are lesbians. The queer aspect of lesbian side, which is also a term that the LGBTQ community is trying to put forward in the political agenda internationally, 
is we are being killed because of our sexual orientation. And nobody's talking about this. Marielle herself had a long-term relationship with Monica. She was planning to get married in 2019. And this was very public. This was not never ha he, hidden from either Marielle or Monica. And this was something that it was from uh, Marielle's, Marielle Franco's agenda, not only because of her own experience with lesbophobia, but her community. Her community also coming from the favela, because the experience of homosexuality in the favela is very violent. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you're making visible the dimensions of oppressions, she's talking about the queer community dying. She's talking about uh, this le lesbian side that I mentioned. And this idea that is in, these oppressions are intersectional, they are black people. This map of violence uh, told us a lot about how women are being sexualized or hypersexualized and suffering oppressions. But these oppressions are not just on the point that they die. These oppressions are a process, part of a process of naturalization of hypersexualizing the, the female body, especially the black female body. So that brought Marielle to be engaged in many campaigns. One of these campaigns is no means no, no and no. No means no is um, international, as I said, the, glo the global campaign is internationally known and how it uh, requires a contextualization in the Brazilian setting for us to understand what it means, no means no, in Brazil. This is part of uh, many laws that was approved by Marielle. One of them is against the sexual harassment in the public transportation. This was very serious and only this year many uh, because we have phones and we, it's easy to just reach out for your phone and, and film things, uh, you can just go on Google and, and see sexual has harassment in public transportation in Brazil. And you're going to see many pictures and videos of men doing many bad things. I, 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 I don't think I need to give you details, but it's it's, it's not only disgusting, it's frightening because women having ejaculation on the arms, women uh, being almost raped or raped in the public transportation when it's crowded and nobody's seeing that the man is taking his penis out. And this is, this is very serious. So Marielle Franco not only designed this project and it was approved uh, in the chambers, but she also went to the street and she engaged in the demonstrations on the street, which is very interesting because you don't see much a politician going to the demonstrations with, you know, the board and, and with a hat and this kind of thing. So she was one of these uh, politicians that was doing that. Uh, and this, in this quote that I show here, she's saying that, in Portuguese, she's saying that a cada estupro, seja ele coletivo ou não, nós mulheres somos violentadas juntas. For each rape, may this rape be collective or not, uh, we as women are all raped together. This is coming from the idea, um, uh, I don't know if you, if you are familiar with Audre Lorde, but unless all of us are free, none of us will be free. If one of us, one woman is raped, all of us are going to be exposed to this kind of violence. And we need to be aware of how this violence can, where this violence can get us. That's why in her last speech, she's talking about the killing of black women, because there is a long process of, of oppressions that is from the, this public transportation sexual, sex, sexual harassment. There is also the, the way that 
the toxic masculinity can happen, during her last speech, one of the male uh, politician came to her to bring her a flower. And he interrupted her speech. And she was like, what do you want? Men doing men things. You're interrupting my speech about you know, politics for, black, for women to give me a flower once a year, for God's sake. So she called him out in the middle of her speech which is very interesting because <laughs> she's, she's trying to denounce exactly what happened in that context. You see, this interruption is the symbol of how we naturalize the toxic masculinity. And this killing that she's denouncing is just a dead end. It starts with the guy screaming. It starts with the guy shaking you. It starts with the guy just frightening you because the way of he speaks to you. And this, I am uh, doing a kind of a binary uh, situation between men and women because I'm calling out this, the reason for these killings are usually from by men. But I'm not saying that in queer homes, uh, heteronormativity is not playing a role, okay? I'm just calling attention to the fact that th these male subjects, let's say, are being a threat to the lives of women. Um, so, the favela is not a problem, favela is a solution. This is something that Marielle said, but many people who studied and lived in favela uh, is saying, so it's a political statement that is, is coming from historical uh, political engagements. And I need to say that Considering favela as a solution is something that is so political and it has a totally different uh, understanding of how this community can be seen. Remember I said in the beginning, let's not stereotype favela as the crime scene of Brazil. That would be minimizing the entire community building that favela meant since the abolition of slavery, or even before the abolition of slavery, where uh, black people did not have the right to land and they had to occupy free land or state land that was stolen from the indigenous uh, communities. And favelas were the, the place to go of black people mainly because they didn't have uh, the right to land. Abolition of slavery was never a thing, actually, in Brazil, because it was always weaved back in a system of oppression, depending on the white master, that he was used the, the name to call, uh, on the labor, on the food, and on the housing. OK, I'm giving this context context because it became the, 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 the name of a community. We have also Favela da Rocinha. Favela da Rocinha would be the little farm favela, okay? And back then, back in the day, in the 50s still, this favela was uh, many little farms, let's say pieces of land, in which they would exchange potatoes and tomatoes, uh, lettuce and fruits with each other so that's the way they could maintain the community. Favela is a growing exchange of community where the families grow and they, they, they build a small house behind the father's house and so on and so forth. Um, and because of this criminalization and racial profiling of favela community, favelados, the understood that it was important to create a military intervention. Just see the time. I mean time, right? Still have time. I hope you're not getting bored. Okay, this military intervention is, especially during the mega events, as you all know, the World Cup, the Olympics, they did something that is, they called, they named removals, which the name, just the name removals is already something that is objectifying these people. What do you remove? 
makeup, polish nail, what else? You remove things. They are removing families. You know the meaning and the impact of, on these people's lives? The places where they used to work, sometimes even losing a job because they're not living close to their job, and sometimes they need three buses to get to the job and three buses to go back to home. That would mean a unsustainable way of life. So what we are talking about here, uh, in these removals, we are talking about constant oppression. But this is not just the removal uh, of housing, putting this family here and putting them in another house where they would feel any dignity. No, that's just removing them. So we have more than 40,000 families being removed and not having a place to go. Sometimes uh, three months of rent was paid to these families, so these families could see like the money of three months at once, uh, managing this kind of economy. Or sometimes they would pay hotels for a few days for the leader of co some communities, and this didn't work out. And it was with the military intervention. So it was not just removing people from the, the houses, what they called removing. Just anytime I'm saying this word removing and calling it, I'm saying like in between <laughs> comillas uh, <laughs> and also challenging this term because I think it's a very racist term, dehumanizing term. Right. So during this event, in order to make the Olympics and the World Cup to happen, they have to do that, but also they had to clean the place from crime. What does it mean? Let's call the military intervention. Let's call the, 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 uh, the Brazilian army, right? That increased the killings in the favelas to the roof. This was the maintenance of a racist style of power. What uh, our flag in Brazil is saying in the middle is order and progress. So imagine how people are freaked out. People, I mean the president of the republic, is freaking out to show that we have order and progress for the visitors, for the tourists, for the people who are coming to see the Olympics. But people who did went there, they didn't. They saw, oh, Brazil is so great, Brazil is so nice, there is no crime in here. But yeah, of course, the dead bodies were cleaned before you arrived. <laughs> that was basically it. And then what happened with crime, the map of crime is spread around Rio de Janeiro. It didn't end, because it don't end crime. What do you do? You're gonna kill everyone, even though when they state fails, crime recruits. That's not me. I, I wish I said that, that phrase because I think it's so pretty, but it wasn't me. Um, it was a, an activist uh, from Manchester. I'm sorry. Her name is Akinia Minot, and she does uh, work with communities in Manchester about gangs. And she said that, and, and it, it's brilliant because that's exactly what happens. Yes? Um, what, does the, what do you mean by recruit in this context? Do you know what recruiting means? Uh, like you, the army recruits people to fight for this. Yeah, crime recruits because I can offer you to have a, a Nike on your, uh, on your feet uh, and you're going to leave for maybe less than half of what you could leave in your life, but at least for this time, of, this time frame, you're going to leave with a bit of money in your pocket every week. If your family is starving, if the state doesn't provide for your family, the crime needs someone to be killed. So it's recruiting because everyone is dying, uh, not directly or indirectly uh, through crime, right? So the lives of, of uh, young men uh, in this kind of of reality is average 24 years old. And 
black kids die in the favelas not because they are part of any gangs, it's just because they are running. 10 years old, uh, before Marielle was killed, 10 years old boy, black boy, he was just running and he was killed. He was shot dead on his back by the police. This is serious. So the day before Marielle was killed, she tweeted until what is the limit of this war? Until when we have to go with this so we end this war? Because uh, uh, a man, a young man, 24 years old, if I'm not wrong, maybe younger than that, was coming back from the church and he was killed by the police. And she said, and she said in her campaign, um, I am working as a favelada in the in the political scene because I want to change. I want to make a change. I don't think it's normal to have to listen to the security uh, agent in the favelas that they didn't kill anyone yet today. This is unacceptable to listen this kind of thing from a police officer who is supposed to be working for you, not against you. For you in terms of serving the community, I, I'm not talking in terms of being the servant of people, okay? Just to clarify, I don't want to reproduce enslavement ideas in this conversation. Um, okay, so Marielle uh, and Anderson Gomes were assassinated on the 14th of March in 2018. Uh, it was an execution, and we can say that for sure. We can say that without any doubt, because the style of execution is shooting people many times on the head. That's what happened to Marielle. Anderson Gomez was the driver of the car. She was, in, she was leaving a meeting for human rights in the favelas, uh, and she was going back home for dinner with Monica, who was at home waiting for her. They just spoke on the phone, and then uh, a person approached the car and started shooting. I need to say something in the context of this assassination before I go on to this analysis. In that month, or in the beginning of that year, uh, or this year, Marielle was uh, named the chair of the Human Rights Observatory, so they could start uh, analyzing how the police actions were in the favelas. That meant you start denouncing in a formal way, not only on Twitter, not only in, in, the, in the demonstrations, it's on papers and it's in, from the uh, city chamber. So that would be a very formal way. With, with that, the state would have to do something. So she was the chair of this human rights observatory and she was going to promote assistance to families who, who, who lost someone in this war on drugs. That meant being assistant of, um, of police officers' uh, families as well. Because both families are from poor backgrounds, police officers also live in the favelas, and they are also suffering with this ideology of criminalization in the favelas. So she was understanding this kind of process, and she, she understood that this uh, human Rights Commission would be very important to promote policies for that community. That was a threat th to the system. When, when we say she was executed, she was executed by the police, we're just asking who killed Marielle because we know that was the police. We just need to know who gave the order, who is behind that. So this is what we are asking the investigations, all right? Now, what does it mean, Marielle being killed? We have a, 
um, this term of it, which is called the necropolitics. After her death, entire Brazil, the entire Brazil went to the street to do demonstrations for Marielle. It doesn't matter if people were from right, from wrong, from from right, right from. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I get very emotional when I talk about her, so I, I, I'm sorry. It's just too much for me. Um, it doesn't matter if people were from left or from different backgrounds. They, you can see that Marielle was someone who could also be anyone's neighbor. You know, she was from a working class. She was lesbian. She was black. She was a mother uh, when she was a teenager. She was from Rio de Janeiro, but at the same time she was talking in this global way also in the Brazilian context. She was she was this in dialogue with what was happening in the northeast of Brazil, in the north, in the south. So she was this person that could be anyone's neighbor, anyone's auntie, anyone's cousin, anyone's daughter, you know? And so people were very emotional and they went to the streets and they occupied the 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 streets they occupied the 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 city halls they went in masses i would say millions of people and this necropolitics is what the media did with her dead body was either invisibilizing not talking about that oh just a politician died Psh, never talked but when they, set, they saw the social movements going to the streets saying, hey, what's going on? What's going on? Marielle presente. Marielle is present. They started depoliticizing her image, her identity, and the work that she was doing. OK, she was a political. She was so nice. They didn't show the fierce, the courageous, the, the, the black empowerment that she had in her work. They never mentioned the word racism or lesbophobia when they were talking about Marielle. And when they don't do that, when they don't call attention to this political uh, framework, what do they do? They do the depoliticization of her body, of her image, of her identity. And that's when we lose the control of the narrative. Oh, it's just a human being die, died in the favela. In the favela is the place of people to people to die. If you die in the favela, you probably had something. You probably had some drugs. You were hiding drugs for the drug dealers because you were a drug dealer protector. That's why they started talking about her. Oh, no, she was, she was just protecting human rights for people who do wrong things. Uh, she, she was involved with crime and so many other things that they completely erased her entire work. They didn't mention anything about her queerness, but when they did, they did in a very romantic and sens sensationalist way. What I mean by that? Oh, Monica, uh, they just cut the parts when Monica is crying and saying, we're getting married next year. They didn't say about her political agenda for lesbian people. They didn't talk about the lesbian side that she was fighting against. They didn't explain how her agenda was put forward. And that's what I mean, the media failed. And this use of her story was so wrong that is the continuation of the authorization of racist arguments and homophobic and misogynist and so on. And this framed the entire elections of 2018 this year. Okay? Because it was based on this hate discourse that Brazil elected Jair Bolsonaro. There is no picture of him. If you want, you can Google, but I, as a political act, would not put any picture of this man here uh, when I'm talking about Marielle. But he used the, the notion of black people. He used to, to say he's very well known by his racist, misogynist uh, comments. Uh, but the, 
the sad part is how the city uh, councillors was also elected through this hate crime kind of speech. Yes? Well, that's the guy who said he, he uh, has, he would, uh, can I have a Yeah, yeah, yeah. He would rather a toten son than a schmuel son. No, he said that he preferred to have a dead son than a gay son. Yeah. He also said that uh, his his sons would never fall in love with a black woman because he educated his sons very well. I wouldn't like to be in love with any of the, his sons anyway. So thank you very much. Uh, maybe I was well educated, but this is a very uh, problematic way that framed the entire elections. Uh, showing Marielle Franco only as the angry black woman. And in this picture, I think it's very interesting. It's, it's, this picture is amazing, right? She is in the middle of a demonstration. And sometimes on Google, you can see only his pic this picture cropped. So you, you only see her face. But this is important. She is in the middle of a lot of people, black people. And she is... Uh, in a demonstration when you usually don't see politicians doing and going and being part of this kind of things, right? Uh, they never talked about her fears, her courageousness, her strength. They just talked about the stereotypification of the black woman, either as a romantic, I'm going to marry next year, or the crazy, the angry, no? and which is also a way to stereotype uh, the black women. Now, I'm going to introduce a, a term which I think is important and, and can describe in a better way, not the angry black woman, because we are not angry. The system makes us angry sometimes. Yeah, racism makes me angry. And if it doesn't make people angry, we should have a conversation about this. But um, it's about being a Mefrica Ladina, right? Lelia Gonzalez was talking about this, and I'm just putting two uh, her stories in parallel now because I'm just going to open a parenthesis just to explain what a Mefrica Ladina means. Oops. Lelia Gonzalez was a daughter of an indigenous woman and a black man. She was married to a Spanish white man whose family left him because he wanted to marry a black woman. Uh, his, her, her husband suffered with um, depression, killed himself. She saw herself alone. And he, she says that she, he was always, always inspiring her to talk about her blackness. But she said, I could never talk just about my blackness. My mom is indigenous. So in, through her work, and it's very beautiful, strong, poetic, sometimes using even psychoanalysis, she came up with this term, a mefrica ladina. So she said, we need to talk about people and geographical spaces. So we're talking about indigenous and black people. And we need to talk about America Latina, the Caribbean, and Africa, all together. We cannot just isolate our histories in one space. We also need to talk about the Ladina. Why she puts D here instead of a T? It's not Latina, which could be. It's Ladina. The, this name, Ladino, Ladina, also traveled through history, and it meant so many things it meant brave person, courageous, strong person. It meant people coming from Europe to Latin America, especially Jewish people, in a very derogatory way. Oh, that's a Ladino, like not good. Um, it also meant black people in a certain part of the history to say, to say in a derogatory way, oh, that's a black person, or that's an N-word, you know? So, not good. So, Ladino meant 
the marginalized other all the time. But at the same time, the meaning of being strong, being brave. So I don't think she just put the D just because, you know, uh, it could mean it could mean Latin, Latino. I think she was very intentional about that. And there is no other word that I think it would represent Marielle Franco so well. It had to be a word that was invented. There was no word to describe this woman, right? And in this, uh, in this voicing that Marielle had, uh, and I would dare to say she has, is very present in the way politics took over or took a turn or at least continued to be very fierce because now uh, during the elections time we had this authorization of the racist, misogynist, homophobic kind of discourse but we also had many black women being elected exactly because of that as a way of resistance. So making a change means we still, it would, it would be, especially now after Bolsonaro uh, won the election, it would be a victory to have an answer about who killed Marielle. So this is the first um, cartaz sign that is here <laughs> in the demonstration after Marielle died. Uh, people asking who killed Marielle. Making a change in terms of actually taking serious uh, in, in the investigations about how institutions and the police are so criminal in this kind of situations. It's terrible. But yes, we do have a change. Marielle, Marielle Franco's day, which is the 14th of March, became a law in Rio de Janeiro city. And now it's the day against the genocide of the black woman, which is something that it's not to celebrate, but it's to remember. It's to remember the kind of fight that is not being depoliticized in the history of Marielle Franco. Yes? So was it institutionalized as a day to remember by yeah, yeah. The city council okay. is stated that by law, mm -hmm. this day will be the day Marielle Franco against the genocide of the black woman. Yeah. So I am not sure. I, I don't know if it's going to be a holiday, if it's going to be a bank holiday, or this kind of thing. But the, it's, it's institutional to remember. And the chamber that she was speaking, you know, the first picture that I showed you, uh, that chamber. That particular space is called Marielle Franco now. So every white, middle class, heterosexual man that steps up there, he will have to see, oh, Marielle Franco space. Anyway, at least people will have to learn her name, and even if they don't know exactly, or they don't get exactly what she did, what she was doing. Right, uh, just to end, uh, I would like to present a few Black women who were elected uh, in the elections of 2018, because I think it's important to say that we are not going to be demoralized just because we have an authoritarian, racist, homophobic, mass wheeling, mass killer uh, kind of person being the president of Brazil. There are Many black women uh, now elected in Brazil as a way of resistance from the left parties. Uh, and by saying from the left parties, I just, I just want to highlight that not because black people are black, that they are going to serve the resistance or they are going to work with the resistance community. Some black people will work for the right and they will uh, authorize this kind of a racist uh, or the power of whiteness. And I can do anything about that. What I can do is to work with these people and, and to admire what they are doing. So these are pictures of women who were elected. The first one is Lacey Brandon. I need to say something about that <laughs> because I worked with her 
And she is coming from the Samba community. And she one day decided, okay, I, I do, I do the singing, I do the entertainment, but I have to do something more. So she decided to be in the politics. And now she is, and she was reelected. Uh, but the, I think she is the most old school person. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, she's definitely the eldest. And then Benedita da Silva here, also uh, from the old school. The rest of them are pretty much like new generation. So we have at least two transgender black women uh, elected. We have Talia Amaral here. Uh, and many others who are now opening this space of conversations that we need so much, right? So when I started, I said, Marielle is coming from a space of discussion, conversations, anti-racist conversations, right? And now that she's dead, we are also continuing these conversations. And that's why in the middle of these pictures, Marielle became seed. And we are trying to flourish and we are trying to resist. And by we, I'm totally engaging with this conversation and I'm also part of this. So thank you very much. I say Marielle Presente because Marielle is still present in this anti-racist movement, in anti-lesbophobia, anti-LGBTQ phobia, and Marielle Presente now and always. So thank you very much. A reason yeah. why? Yes. Yes. Uh, when I presented the the report of deaths mm -hmm. in Rio de Janeiro, I'm sorry. <laughs> when I presented the data, uh, it says that it's because society is misogynist. First of all, feminicide means women being killed just because they're women. Bah. But then there are the intersectionality that is related to that. So they're being killed because they're women and black and l lesbians, and there are many other things and transsexual because they do not even they are not even considering transsexual women in some of the reports. So transsexual women are still being taken in the male prison sometimes uh, for any reason by any reason I mean. The other day, a transsexual woman just parked her motorcycle in front of a bar, police officers stopped her, they took her to the prison, the male prison. She was brutally raped and kicked and beaten up and she almost died. Well, I won't talk about cases that they actually died, but in these cases, it's just because they're women and there are so many intersections that are creating more and more oppressions over them. Um, so there, not only the misogynist aspect and the sexist aspect, but it's racist and it's also LGBTQ phobic. Yes? Um, so when you say that uh, the black women were killed, they were killed by a policeman or the institution of the state, or what do you mean? Yeah, on the data, they also talk about, in the context of Brazil, they are killed mainly by their partner. 54%, uh, if I'm not wrong, it's by their partner or ex-partner. And then the rest are by family or members of community. But that's in the Brazilian context. 
in some other countries they are killed because they are walking on the street or you know the the concentration of the the of the numbers are elsewhere but it's because they are women yeah her having stated that uh, um, the data about um, feminis feminicide um, yeah, isn't, isn't um, differentiated enough so that she, she said, okay, we have to look further uh, for the intersectional aspect. Has it had any impact about yes. having more precise? Yeah. Thank you for this question because I didn't mention one of her uh, of the projects of law that she designed and now it was approved this year after her death in the in the city chamber was to make a commission to report the oppressions against women in Rio de Janeiro. So only only designing this kind of a report will require to look at LGBTQ community, community in the favelas, uh, black community in general. So they will be able to look at this further. That was something that she was calling attention to, but I hope that it was actually a seed that will flourish. Yeah. Yeah. Following her legacy, maybe? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so let, me, let me take this question, too. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was a little bit <laughs> shocked when I heard all about it. So you talked about, like, uh, about people self-identifying as black, like, make up a total of population, like, 50%? More than 53, More than. for sure, yeah. <laughs> so how? So how can this happen that you have such a racist government when part of its population, I, I mean, we don't talk about the minority, it's, it's like half of the population, how it can be the racist against black people, especially against black women. That's something that, that's stuck in my head and I don't get to understand how is that possible. Me neither. <laughs> no, actually, <laughs> it's, it's horrible. It's, it's painful. And I, I appreciate that you were saying that it, you were shocked and this kind of things because it is to be shocking. Uh, we, have a, we, we tend to forget that the colonial past is so present in our days. And it's so present in the way people are approving uh, laws and designing policies. And that's why uh, it's so, like, it was so normalized for for a time that now we are sh still shocked, and we we should be. But I think it's a historical process. But yes, the majority of the population is uh, black. However, we still call it a minority because it's it's not represented from the TV to the politics in anywhere, and this is a really uh, high risk situation. That's why, just to link with the, your question, women of color, uh, by women of color I'm also talking about indigenous women that I didn't cover in this particular session, but indigenous women are being elected as well. And they do have, this agenda is uh, shared, let's say it's in common. So the project of laws and things that they are trying to approve in terms of social policies uh, in the parliament are very important. So now, these women are not just um, in the city councillors, they are in the parliament. They were elected in the parliament. So we hope that they will survive to make a change. So, so just the, the parliament of the city or the whole country? No, parliament in the country, ah, okay. yeah, yeah. Some uh, actually in the state level, like let's see, Brandon. Others in the um, 
how to explain this parliament organization? Let's say they are in the in the capital of Brazil, representing their state to approve national laws, national projects. Yeah, I think that that's a good way to explain the, how the parliament organized. Uh, so my, my question, I've, I've been talking to a lot of people in Rio too about how, what kind of failure happens in order to, for us to see the situation that we see today, mm -hmm. where a lot of the people in the movements also voted for Bolsonaro, right? So it's not, um, yeah, it's more, com it's complicated. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, gay people, black people, women, all chose to vote Clombola. against mm. again to to, against their interests. So one of the conversations that happened was to do with um, how we put too much of a faith in the state. Because if we go back to critical race theory, there is this theory that the state was created to protect property, including the bodies of uh, black people seen as property. And the protection of people only happens when there's interest convergence between capital and people. And right now there's no interest convergence. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why is it that we expect the state that is fundamentally racist, patriarchal, heteronormative, and capitalist to give us anything but that? And is there any other form of resistance that can happen outside of this framework that has been gifted to us? Yes, I think this question has two folds kind of answer, maybe. Uh, the first one is, Charles Mills talk about um, the racial contract, okay? So just for everyone to know, there are many philosophers who talk about the social contract. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but it's talking about the everyone is equal under the law and everyone will be treated equally because we have a social contract. What Charles Mills is saying is that there was never such a thing. It, the contract was always racial, putting the people of color in a very specific hierarchical uh, space that is under the white person. So even if they get to to reach the the standards or uh, of money or being rich, they still going to be undermined in this kind of a um, racial contract. They still can be killed by the police if they stopped and searched and so on. So there is one aspect of this contract that I totally agree and it can be translated to the Brazilian context because it was never social, it was always racial and this has been reproducing the genocide of indigenous people as a river of blood every day. Okay, I am analyzing the, inter the military interventions in Brazil and the number of times Labour Party, which should be the left in Brazil, for some, uh, called the military intervention to indigenous people so many times with so much more public money than the previous administration that was from the, the right wing. So this is symbolic oppression. Well, it's not symbolic oppression. It's actually being very materialistic in the way they're killing people, but it's uh, the symbolic aspect of racism that we don't read in straightforward ways, okay? Uh, the other aspect, I think it's the awareness of people in, in practice of the education that, in my view, Marielle was pretty much engaged in. She was, um, she was on the base trying to do this uh, work of awareness, which is very difficult because we find many resistance. Uh, now I, I just want to give an example, maybe it's too individual, but I hope it works. Uh, I have half of my family is black and from poor farm kind of context and some of them very, very conservative. It, they are coming from a very conservative way of thinking because of the religion, the Christian religion, and therefore it leads them to understand politics in a very conservative way as well, thinking that there is no such thing as racism and 
we don't have to have this kind of social policies to enable black people to go to university because they have to work to make a way to success. And they have this idea that is, uh, well, really problematic about meritocracy. Unfortunately, uh, well, we have conversations, but unfortunately, that's the consequence of that is electing Bolsonaros. Bolsonaro's in plural because his family was also elected. His uh, people who were working with him were also elected. They accused these women from Rio de Janeiro, Talíria, well, from Minas Gerais as well, uh, of, this is a very bad way to say that, but they accused this women from Rio de Janeiro, Talíria spe specifically, that she won the election surfing on Marielle Franco's caixão, coffin. Uh, that's a very ugly thing to say because they are not understanding that we are coming from a generation of resistance. So this is, 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 is um, I think this awareness and this educational process is really slow and hopefully, hopefully we will be able to make changes, but I don't think it will be easy, especially among us. I come from the black movement. I know that we disagree about a lot of things, and whiteness and white supremacy in a way that it is uh, established in Brazil has very well known the target. They know the target. So it's one target. And among us, we have so many other specificities that we, it's, it's difficult even to make uh, agreement among us in terms of agenda and so on. So I hope we manage, but it's a long task. It's a long task. Yeah, we s well the investigations are kind of a. I I couldn't say making progress. I would not say that. Um, they know that the arsenal used to kill her was from the police, and then the police stated that this arsenal was um, robbed in 2011, and then they changed their minds. So it's a he told me, she told me, you know this kind of. Uh, disagreements and contradictions that is to confuse the public, it's to confuse the police, and it's not to go further with investigations. So I think if even the, the people who are investigating this case, if they are taking this seriously, they know that their life is at stake as well. So we still don't have an answer. Yeah. I'm not quite sure why, why would she be able to, to get into police crimes in this commission? I think you mentioned some part of the Yeah, what, what is that you don't understand? Um, so she would have been able to access papers, or, or what, what would be the difference now that she was in Ah, the yeah. The no, she would be able to, to analyze the, the cases. Someone is killed by the. Uh, she would get access to the cases. To the police cases. Yeah, yeah, because usually how how it happens in the favelas is that it doesn't even become a police investigation when someone is killed in by the police or by the gangs or by the war, by the shooting between gangs and the uh, and the police. So it doesn't even become an investigation. So I was analyzing the data about people being killed in Brazil, general, okay, data. When they killed in Brazil, when they're killed by the police, sometimes they don't even, like they say that the race is not identifiable. I don't know what they do with the bodies. They, they can't identify the race of the person, you know? So it doesn't become registered. It doesn't become a data in any way. And I don't understand how it could be acceptable that the police can register someone being killed without any data. So uh, race is, 
unless they're burning the bodies, which is possible, okay? But we are talking about the data that is caused by shooting. So the data caused by shooting is not even a reliable data. So the, national, the International Amnesty in Brazil is investigating the cases, and they have more data than what the police is offering. So basically, what I'm trying to say is, you can have access to this information just by going to the favelas. Yeah.
cruel and ne necropolitical. You know, mm -hmm. when we talk about necropolitics, and we're talking about how the the everyday life is ruled by death, not mm -hmm. by life, by death. Mm -hmm. When death becomes the common, the when death becomes what you actually experience in a rare everyday life, or the fighting of surviving, you know, because you don't like to be killed. Like the young man you were talking about, the 10 years, who was just killed because he was in the wrong place, no? At mm -hmm. the wrong time. That's, that's also a term that um, Hollywood has very much spread around, Excellent. looking at, at projects, at uh, neighborhoods in the United States where mainly black people live, no? Um, so this casualty of death is something that can happen every day, and it might happen because you're a woman, because you're trans, because uh, you're disabled, because you're homeless, because you're black, you know, or a refugee. It's something that unfortunately is how societies, also modern societies, are, mm -hmm. are working. So I think it's, it's really very interesting what you have uh, introduced us. And the need actually to do this kind of political work that uh, Marielle was doing, which was, of course, when one can look at it and think, oh, how does it come that she's so convinced that on the parliamentary level there is the possibility of making change? But you also show us that it's happening in a political conjuncture mm -hmm. when different movements come together and try to, to create some kind of transformation. Mm -hmm. um, so, and um, at the same time, you, we see also how institutions or organi organizations can be created in order to, um, to create some, some kind of institutional uh, material ways mm -hmm. of um, following up what's going on, following, uh, giving some, one of her projects was about supporting also uh, the families, you know, the relatives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so creating infrastructures also of support. You know? yeah. So I think it's quite interesting. So it was more common than a question. Uh, a lot of questions have been also raised. And I don't know if you'd like to say something. I just no? want to congratulate <laughs> <laughs> you for showing this so nice. Okay, Thank you. Like to say um, also not a question, but a comment. I think it was really, really nice to see how she frames the whole, the whole system, and it's really important to put, uh, give a name to it as structural violence, mm -hmm. and structural violence mostly means the state. That it also has to be said, and she kind yeah. of does it, and that is very, very important yeah. because. The name of these kinds of structural violence change so often. So, like, I understand the question, like, who killed her? Who killed these women? Because that is, those are the first questions we ask. But um, it is actually it's important on one level because those people have to be punished so that we start stopping the violence, stop, uh, mm -hmm. stopping the circle, like giving a cut to it. But at the same time, it's not important because. It's not this one person, two people, or whatever. In places like these, where there, there's such resistances, people say, you know, it's the state that is killing us for not bringing the right policies, for having a blind eye. Or like, in Turkish, it's really <laughs> nice. Uh, being custody, the word custody is being under eye, being under watch, and people disappear under watch. So how can you lose someone while watching that person. Uh, so even kind of playing with these kinds of words already tell you, okay, who, where it goes at the end of the circle. Uh, and yeah, what, what was that going? I lost my own. Mm -hmm. talking, about talking about the structure of violence. Uh, yes. um, the thing is, when these kinds of violences are talked in Brazil, in here, and there are many activists, when we talk about it, uh, about especially sexual violence, domestic violence, and so on, uh, in other, many other places, they say the state is killing us for not doing this, for not doing that, or the men's love kill us, because it's mostly uh, the husband, the brother, the whatever, and so on. But 
there is an important thing there because when it comes to places like Germany, for example, it becomes cultural. It becomes those people killing each other. And I think what is really important here is that it's not the solution is the favela. Uh, says that that is not the problem, that's not one separate part that is there, that the upper level people mm. can solve, but rather that is the solution, that is not the problem. And by not enabling that solution, you are actually the problem. So it's pointing finger to the right place here is very important, and that has to be really, really named, and you did it very well. I think. Thank you very much. Actually, I wanted to show how the this is a structure in terms of how the state is responsible for these intersectional violences, but also how this affects people's lives. So what you said about um, having the responsibility of the state and having this circle stopping, right? Mm -hmm. It's brilliant because that's what I... I kind of tried to say, but I didn't uh, get into details of the circle. Uh, the, having the pacifying po police in the favelas uh, is increasing the problem. And sometimes being justified by the removals, as I said, and the reurbanization, which is just promoting gentrification, which means the favelados won't be able even to pay for the supermarkets surrounding. That's why they have supermarkets or the, the small stores in the favelas for them, because gentrification is, uh, this reurbanization is not for them. It was, n the removals was never for them. And this has the, the little impact on people's lives. And by little, I mean, yeah, one domestic worker is going to lose her job, that's a little one, it's not representing the community. Yeah, but the other one is going to have to take three buses and the other, and when you see, it's little details that is impacting the entire community and it's affecting in a very negative way. And the consequence of that is how people, the necropolitics uh, is also part of how can we live in constant grieving we are grieving all the time for the neighbor, for the, the son of the neighbor, or for the person I met in the church the other week, or for, so this, is, sh this shouldn't be natural in anyone's life. Uh, and this is the kind of things that I wanted to show, even the detail that I didn't mention, but it's also in this, her story of Marielle Franco. Her partner, Monica, uh, who I think has been showing a lot of uh, strength and She's, she's been really brave. She's going in all demonstrations. She is invited to talk about Marielle, and schools has been named after Marielle, and she goes, and she's very present. Uh, but it's not only about these moments in which we show our face and we say, yeah, I'm here, and I'm fighting racism. But in her everyday life, she's crying, and she's in pain, and this pain shouldn't be normal. This, the, a few weeks ago, uh, the dog died as well. So it was Marielle in March, and the dog died in November. I cannot imagine how these little details in Monica's lives, her partner, is being processed by her, and how this constant, constant grieving should not be normal, especially when the responsible, in the case of Marielle, is the state. Um, so, yeah, just continuing this two comments, <laughs> making a third one, uh, complementing uh, or trying to glue or weave uh, everything. But yeah, yeah, and it's also international, you know. It's how this uh, this connections about being under the watch of the police, we die. So just to make a, a final link with the global uh, movement. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw is involved, is part coordinator, even the creator of a campaign called Say Her Name. And Sandra Bland was one of the wi black women who was killed by the police, and nobody talks about this, and the investigations just. And now uh, it has been launched the film about Sandra Bland. 
I didn't know about that. I was really surprised, well surprised. I hope it's going to make justice to, to, to that. But it's the same thing, how the police brutality is affecting black women's lives. Because even in the Black Lives Matter movement, we had the faces of black men much more than what is going on with the black and queer community, with the women and, and queer black community. And this is very important that we link this kind of uh, experiences and understand that we are coming from a long run of oppressions that we need to be more attentive to. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I think um, maybe another aspect, but we don't need to comment on it. What I found also very interesting in the case of Marielle is that mourning becomes political activism. Mm -hmm. So, and that's very important because uh, it is important to acknowledge that yeah. we mourn and that when people die, also when people die in the Mediterranean, and so many people are dying in the Mediterranean, there are people that are part of our community. That's not the case that they are not part of our community because they have migrants or refugees somewhere else. They are part of our community. Yeah. So mourning should become actually our political practice. Yeah. And what uh, Marielle shows is how many people, you know, were mourning for her. Knowing her, her or not knowing her, but knowing what she stands for. Yeah. And um, I think that's very important, not to consider mourning something that will immobilize us. We have also moments, of course, where we need just to sit and cry, but we can also take this pain as a form of transforming also and collectively transforming. Yes. And that's something that also Marielle has shown, and you might be able just to look on YouTube the videos on the day of her funeral uh, in Brazil, in Rio, and how the streets were full of people um, and uh, it went on for days. Yeah. So, um, and this is, um, was already a political act also of uh, saying we continue, no? yeah. and with this question of how the work is continuing. And Maria, it's continuing on different, on different yeah. levels. Yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, I would like just to comment something yeah. about mourning, which is, it might be silly the example I gave about Monica, uh, about her and the dog and everything, but it is this const constant grieving in mourning. Um, I am from far away. I never met uh, Marielle before, which sometimes I feel like, how come I didn't? We have many friends in common. And, and for me, it's a still a problem. It's a problem <laughs> uh, to write and present about her because all my chapters and my thesis and everything, when I mention her uh, and uh, when I mention this process of pain, it's a painful process and I, I write crying and the process of doing this kind of things is painful but with the awareness that we need to continue, yeah? And it's always a seed, it's always something that moves you forward, but it's difficult, it's painful. Uh, so I, I invite you just like, it's, it's okay, <laughs> you know, it's okay. We cry and we write and we cry and we select pictures in the process, <laughs> but uh, it's also important to experience this. It's also important to experience this thing. It's transformative. And I don't mean this in an any masochist way. I mean this because we understand the meaningful uh, of the human life, like it, it's, it shouldn't be normal black people, indigenous people being killed in, like in this kind of a proportion that we don't even know. And it should like, you know, we passed what, 24 hours without even noticing this kind of things, without thinking about that. So feeling this pain is also political, as you said, and it's very important. So yeah, thank you for allowing me to share this pain as well. Yeah. Thank you, Katusha, again, also for answering all our questions in this. My extent. pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. a lot.